Thank you. What an unusual way this has all uh, worked out to get back here again. I actually, just all a coincidence, a church flew me in from Germany to speak. Calvary Church in Santa Ana had a couple thousand people there yesterday morning, and uh, my flight for London and then over to Germany doesn't leave till six o'clock tonight, and so I have this privilege at, of sharing again with you, and I just thank God for what he's doing in your midst, and quite a few of you now are in my Facebook. Some of you send me emails. Many of you are in that category. Thank you. Of course, a lot of those I got linked with are now graduated, as I also spoke at your commencement, and it's just amazing to see the Holy Spirit scattering Biola people all over the world. It's exciting, and I hope you have a spirit of expectation for your missions conference. Remember, it was the Lord Jesus who said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. It's not a missions thing, certainly not a George Verwer thing. It's a Jesus thing. The bottom line for missions, which I believe would excite everybody on the campus, even many non-Christians get excited if they just grasp this concept. Missions is people, helping people, loving people, doing what is sensible, what is right in every possible situation, of course, across the higher, the entire globe. And one of my passages of scripture, and we're battling the clock, so some of them I may just refer to rather than read them, reading them all, uh, is that Macedonian call. The apostle Paul and his team seem to be trying one direction, the Holy Spirit stopped them, they tried another direction, the Spirit of Jesus stopped them there in uh, Acts chapter 16, and then they had this vision and they had the call to go over to Macedonia. And immediately, immediately Paul left for Macedonia and the work of God began in Europe, where I've lived now for 49 years. I got so in love with Europe, so fell into the ground in Europe that only India could draw me away. And then I ended up living in India and Nepal. But I, did, I never did manage to get that furlough back to my uh, own country. But maybe someday I'll do that. But thanks to cheap airline tickets, you can sort of fly wherever you have to. I just come back from India, a land of over one billion people. And when we look at India, uh, if we look at small picture, I don't know if you're a small picture person or a big picture person. Uh, we're all a bit of both, right? But at the end of the day, if I'm honest about myself, I'm a big picture person. At the same time, when it comes to people, individual people, then I'm just a small picture, one person at a time. And since 2.30 this morning, I've prayed for probably 200 people through my Facebook and through my emails that come in from around the world. I'm still praying for people I went to Santa Ana with, uh, with the Boy Scouts when I was only 14 years old. So it was great to be back in Santa Ana, except when I was there as a Boy Scout, it was all fields. I talked to a guy that was in the same, same scout troop. He's a good friend of mine. He's into the oil business there in New Jersey and loves to give money to me, and I'm always you know, sort of willing to humble myself and receive the money. So uh, it's just so exciting to, to look at the small picture and to look at individual people. But this morning, I hope we can also be big picture people. And I'm going to say something in a way that I've never quite said it before in preparing for this. It came to me uh, yesterday. But I was just referring to India where I've just come from. I had about 38 meetings in 18 days. Spoke to about 17,000 people. In this land of over a billion people, it's OM's biggest field, especially our work among the Dalits. And you can get a free book about the untouchables by Joseph D'Souza, $15 book as a gift when you walk out of the auditorium, they're setting up the tables in three locations right now. That book is a gift. The story of the untouchables, 200 million. It's like apartheid, like slavery, it's like segregation, but it's still happening. And praise God, revolutionary, radical students around the world are beginning to grasp this human slavery. And Joseph D'Souza, the founder of the Dalit Freedom Network, has given the, written that book, and I bought a lot, and I'm giving him away. But as we look at India, the small picture is so exciting. There's so many ministries. OM alone is two and a half thousand people. We planted 2,800 churches in the last few years. We've opened up almost 100 schools. Some of the most proactive churches 
for our schools in India are right here in California. One church wants to open 10 schools. I have breakfast with a pastor, I think, a year ago when I was here. If we had time, I could just tell you about so many phenomenal ministries. I was just with one in Calcutta, in the slums among the poor. Uh, we could write hundreds, thousands of stories of different ministries. But the big picture is that hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions in India have never yet even heard or read the gospel. And I'm looking for people somehow that are willing to, to be mega big picture people. In one way, mega big picture, it doesn't even start until you hit 50 million. A lot of ministries are reaching a million, two million, five million. A lot of ministries are only reaching a few. All of them are important. God is working in different people in different ways. But I wonder if there's anybody here that's the way I was as a university student. I then, through my Mexico short-term experience, left university and went to Bible college and had the privilege of graduating from Moody Bible Institute. I'm really apologize. I hadn't even heard of Biola at that time. I was a baby Christian from New Jersey. And uh, when I came to the Boy Scout thing, nobody told me about Biola. So uh, forgive me, that was a long time ago. But I'm looking for people that are willing just to try to be hyper, mega, big picture people. Don't think anything less than 50 million. Anything less than 50 million. Just too small for these next few minutes. Think in terms of hundreds of millions because we're living in a world of one billion and a world, especially in the church, filled with small picture people, which is fine, but unfortunately also small-minded people, and that is not good at all. And I'm sure you've experienced the heavy, you know, experience of talking and meeting small-minded people. You just... You know, you're screaming on the inside, oh, Lord, deliver me from this person. And, uh, and you're praying, of course, that they'll get saved or that something else. And then you're repenting like me for bad attitudes and wanting to punch someone. So we're not supposed to have that feeling anymore as Christians, but I certainly do. It's not either or. Praise God, a lot of you have a small vision. I remember students sharing with me when I was here last time a lot of their little Mickey Mouse visions, and I mean the smaller visions. And uh, uh, again, I'm not against that, but are there any people here would think with me about 200 million Dalits or 300 million OBC, other backward caste, or would think with me about China where hundreds of millions have never once heard would dream for more creative ways to reach the masses through radio, through television, through the internet, through the arts, through literature, through DVD. We're trying to launch a program to distribute another 100,000 DVDs of a powerful film about Jesus done by Indians, especially for India, called Daya Sagar. Already showing this film, hundreds of thousands have professed faith. But in the age of DVD, we need to be able to give away DVDs by the hundreds, get them into all the different communities. It's amazing. This is actually happening in Canada and New York City and a few places here where there's money. People are distributing the, the other Jesus film, more the Western Jesus film, Campus Crusade, free of charge to tens of thousands. We got another 50,000 of those in England. I'm in favor of that. But what about India? We're not seeing that kind of mass evangelism. You used to be able to go into the streets in the early days of, of India. Uh, when I first went to India and lived there, you could go in the streets and mobilize an army this size. We actually did it in OM. And in one day, two, three million pieces of literature, or in a few days. Now, because of persecution, evangelistic teams constantly being attacked, that kind of hyper-mass evangelism is much more difficult, which means when I walked through the streets of Calcutta just a few weeks ago, I knew that a couple million souls in Calcutta, where I once traveled up the river with our first ship so many years ago, I knew a couple million have never once heard. Would you at least, even if what I'm sharing seems a bit much for you or a bit bizarre, would you at least pray for more mass evangelism together with all the other kinds of evangelism? If any of you have heard me speak before, you know that I'm concerned 
about a lot of other big picture issues. I'm concerned about HIV AIDS, 40 million in infected. We have a lot of small picture activities. We could write books and tell stories. We always have those admissions conferences, but I hope as you hear the stories, you realize tens of millions of HIV AIDS people are not being reached. Please take this book. It's a gift, a $10 book. Take it as a gift. There's probably 500 copies sitting there, and it's a real hassle when I have these left over and fly out at 6 o'clock in the afternoon. There's another book on HIV AIDS. It's just being revised. This is the old edition, Patrick Dixon, my guru in this area. And the new edition has been accepted by the UN. Pick up one or the other or both. Some of you know that I'm very much involved in the whole challenge of the unborn. And we don't have time to talk about that. Some people put these things in a separate category from missions. I believe it's part of our mission. It's part of the Great Commission to be involved in social justice, to be involved in social action. In the Lausanne Congress in the mid-70s, there was Billy Graham emphasizing proclamation. But other people like Samuel Escobar, John Stott, some from Asia were emphasizing social action, social transformation, social concern. And in the amazing Lausanne Covenant that tens of thousands of leaders signed in the years to come, it says that proclamation must come together. It must come together with social action. And we need social action for the unborn. Praise God in answer to prayer. In India, the government has passed a new law. It's against the law in India to take a picture, a scan of an unborn baby to tell whether it's a girl. That's now illegal because so many parents, when it's a girl, they murder the girl uh, before she's ever born. There's some things happening like this on a global scale in answer to prayer. Please pick up Randy's amazing book, Why Pro-Life. There's a DVD. I don't have a lot, but I hope you'll pick it up with Christopher Yuan's fantastic testimony this active homosexual with HIV AIDS, major drug dealer, caught by the FBI, put in prison there in Atlanta, somehow gets saved, ends up graduating from Moody Bible Institute, heard me at the missions conference when I auctioned my jacket for my HIV AIDS fund. He gave me $400 for the jacket. I felt a little bad, so I took them to lunch. It was free anyway. And we became incredible close friends. And his testimony is on this DVD. I'm sure someday he'll come to speak at Biola. He's even spoke down at the little chapel, little Rick Warren's little church down the road, Saddleback, gave his testimony. And I just thank God that, yes, as his people, we can be proactive on all of these issues. But I still go back to what God gave me when I was 19. Everybody in the world should hear the gospel at least once. For me, though I'm involved in all these other things, last year I, th I spoke publicly 336 times in 20 nations, challenging people to take steps of faith, to move into the action. We again saw millions of dollars released in answer to prayer to launch our new ship, which has 400 people on it, including my own grandson. I think some of you pray for him. I heard yesterday he was preaching. He's supposed to be in the engine room. He's a welder. But yesterday he was preaching there in Jamaica. And God has just done phenomenal things in this past year. That passage in Acts 16, that Macedonian call, gives me the challenge to give a little Macedonian call this morning. I've already given one for India but what about Tibet, where there are almost no missionaries? What about North Korea, perhaps the most impossible suffering zone, out of control situation in the entire planet, where many believers are in prison, where there are very few open doors, though so new openings are coming for business people? What about Iraq and Iran, the phenomenal needs there? What about Saudi Arabia, with almost no believers? Or places like Yemen, that's falling into the world of terrorism, that little island of Socotra, which is part of Yemen with not a single believer. What can we say of Libya with a few dozen believers in the whole nation? Or Tunisia with a few hundred believers? Or Turkmenistan, a limited access country in Central Asia? There's not more time to give more Macedonians calls, but I'm praying as you consider the panorama of missions 
that you'll consider some of the more unreached places and that you'll not just be a small picture person, but a big picture. And if any of you feel your big picture, because I'm in touch with thousands of small picture people and I love them all, but if any of you can relate to what I'm saying about the 50 million and above group, I'd love to get an email from you. I'm going to stand here after the meeting, just give out my business card that many of you got last year. Remember on the back of the card, the seven people laying by the side of the road that I preached about? My new book drops from a leaking tap. Doesn't sell well. We brought them in from India. It's free. Just take it. You don't have to even read it. Put it under your pillow and I'm going to pray. It does something in the night to your brain in a miraculous way. But in this book, in this book drops from a leaking tap. I share this vision for the children at risk, the abused women, the extreme poor, the HIV AIDS patient, the people who have no access to pure water, 20% of the world, by the way, the unborn, and then Mr. Planet himself, the environment. So I'm just going to stand here, give that out. You get my website, my phone, my two phones, my uh, email, and if you can't find me, you know, you go for counseling as quickly as possible. Now, I haven't actually got to the message that I prepared. Uh, the message I prepared, I wrote some notes because I tend to wander off and preach things that I don't prepare. And the message I, prayer, I prepared is going to really excite you. I've got about 11 minutes. And it's, what is God doing through short-term missions? We know uh, long-term missions is priority. We know that short-term can't be a substitute for long-term incarnational, dynamic, in-depth church planting across the globe. And lately, some people have been writing quite a number of attacks against short-term missions, which is really ridiculous. Because we in the short-term mission movement, we got 50 years of proving that the Holy Ghost raised up this movement. The Holy Spirit raised up this movement. And God is using short-term 100 times more than I believe has ever been properly recorded. Because we're not us short-termers, and I've only been out 49 years. We're not, you know, going around boasting about all we did short-term. I wanted to appeal to people's minds rather than just give them verbal emotion. Though I must confess, I am an emotional person. You didn't know this, that's why I have to tell you. The main thing people remember from my last visit is that I poured water over my head. That was not the main message. <laughs> Some people who sit in the back, you wonder what kind of a jacket I have. This is a global jacket. This is the entire world. What would you expect me to wear? <laughs> if you think this makes, makes a big impact, and it does, we auctioned one off once for $90,000. You should see my underwear. That's what really is cutting edge. But let me at least give you my notes. Why do I believe so fanatically in short-term missions? 53 years after going to Mexico as a short-term missionary. Number one, because we got 50 years of fruit. We got thousands. We have tens of thousands of people who have come to Jesus because of short-termers. Huh? Does that mean anything? The Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven when one soul comes to Christ. Now, we know sometimes people criticize short-termers because they fly all the, way to, all the way to Australia to build a garage for a missionary. I don't think that's really the most strategic thing, but God bless them and he may, who knows, something may happen on the airplane and it'll lead someone to Christ. But most short-term mission is evangelistic. People are coming to Jesus. Churches are being planted. We got 50 years of fruit. No one has ever written the story because it's so decentralized. Yes, there's OM, there's YWAM, there's those that got into short-term missions in the early days, but now thousands and tens of thousands, hey, do you hear that? Tens of thousands, hey, hundreds of thousands, big picture people, of churches are into short-term missions. It's here to stay. It's not going to go away. Of course we need to improve. We don't need to improve long-term missions. huh? The real horror stories come from the long-termers. They don't come from the short-termers. They're not out there long enough to produce a really in-depth horror story like I've had to see on the mission field. The second reason I believe in short-term missions is because uh, many who go become Long-term missionaries. Surveys have shown the number one thing leading to long-term missions is short-term missions. Also, number three, 
it's, or it's part of that same category, it's led many to become mobilizers. Even long-term today, listen, they're saying is an average of 10 years. Some people criticize that. It is complicated. Missions is messy. If I write another book, it's not going to be missiology. It's going to be messiology. How God works in the midst of a mess. Some of you know my favorite proverb. I wrote it myself. Where two or three of the Lord's people are gathered together, sooner or later, there's a mess. But our God knows how to work in the midst of a mess. How else would a guy like me get involved? And I just believe with all my heart, it's a wonderful thing when as many of you as possible can get into short-term missions. Another reason short-term missions is so, so strategic is because when we go, it's a huge encouragement to the youth that were there. My very first trip to Mexico, this little struggling church in Monterey, the young people were blown away that we traveled 3,000 miles from New York City just to be with them and serve them and give our testimonies and go out and witness for Jesus among the braceros or out in the garbage dump, an experience that helped change my life. The whole idea that short-term missions, that the, the short-termer is the main one who benefits. They don't really do much, and sometimes they're a pain in the neck. That gets emphasized quite a lot, even by some missionaries, because there are non-grace awakened missionaries. And if you don't know what that means, then pick up one of my other books. It's actually in this packet. It also doesn't sell, so it's free. This packet has my book, Out of the Comfort Zone. Well, it has sold 100,000. And um, the first chapter, you don't have to read any other chapter. The first chapter is a call to see spiritual revolution in our thinking, in our hearts, to make us more grace awakened toward people we don't agree with, toward strategies we think are completely crazy. So that as Swindoll says in his brilliant book, Grace Awakening, that you can get in your absolutely fantastic bookstop, bookstore, we learn to graciously disagree and press on. It is true that so often we as short-termers, we feel we can't really measure it because we're subjective. We feel we've gained more than we've given. Big thinking research shows it's both. It's both. Of course you gain. The people you go to gain. The vision, the enthusiasm, the mission mobilization. Whole ministries, this is another reason why short term is so important and so vital. Entire ministries, try to get this, are maintained long term by short term people. You say, how do you do that? That's not rocket science. When one short termer goes, follow me, one goes, huh? another one comes. When he goes, another one comes. They come and they go, come and they go, and they come and they go. You say, well, what ministry are you talking about? What about our ships? 40 years history, 100 million people reach, tens of thousands on the way to heaven, hundreds of ministries and churches born, all maintained by short-term people. We even have, oh, God forbid, oh, dear me, short-term captains. How can you have a ship with short-term captains? Because the long-term captain, and on our new ship, it's Dirk Cullender, Cullen Brander from the Netherlands, they want to go on a break. They want to go on a vacation, and they need it. And so when they go, a short-term captain comes, and the ship keeps going. The engine room keeps going. We've got 40 years showing that a major ministry that's reached 100 million, our new ship has just finished its first year. You can get information about it back there. Former director of the ship, Dale Rotan, is there to say hello to you if you're interested in the ships. And just in this first year of Lagos Hope, we've had one half million visitors. Short-termers can help maintain long-term ministry. Let's be set free from the idea that short-term is superficial. It's a false concept. It's a lie straight out of the committee rooms of hell, and we ought to send it back, parcel pulled, pay on delivery. And we need to be careful that we're not intimidated by some of the criticism, some of the horror stories. You can produce or prove anything from horror stories. You can tear anybody down through finding a little bit of dirt in their ministry. You certainly could tear me down 
because I've struggled along in my Christian life so much, even to this day. I've got a few other things written on that paper, but I'll leave it for now because I wanted to close just with this plea, which I think I started with the last time I was here, this plea that God wants to use you. That's now a small picture, right? Just look in the mirror and you'll see the hero. And I want to tell my favorite story because I'm dedicating this to the freshmen. How many here are freshmen? Raise your hand. They're usually the most spirit-filled. You can hear me. There it is. Hallelujah. Man, just woke up in the sound box. <laughs> but I wanted to tell that story that Tony Campalo circulated on an email. Remember the thunderstorm? Terrible thunderstorm. Lightning. The thunder was extremely loud. Even the adults were nervous there sitting in the living room. They remembered their little seven-year-old girl who was up alone in her bedroom. They ran upstairs. They opened the door. And there she was. She was looking out the window. There was another flash of lightning, another burst of thunder. They said, are you okay? She said, oh, I'm fine. I think God is taking my picture. <laughs> Whoa, I never thought of that. I want to ask you, do you really believe with all your heart God loves you? If you do, then you know he has a tremendous plan for your life. And though you may be a struggler like me in this closing minute, I want to just share with those who are struggling. All my life I've struggled a bit with pornography. To, to this, well, I guess my last struggle was maybe some weeks ago. All my life I've struggled with, with attitude problem. All my life I've struggled with a bit of the anger, though I got a lot of victory over that. It wasn't so easy to get victory over irritability. And then this little book, Calvary Road, that you can pick up as a gift by Roy Hessian, that's now in 80 languages, a Christian classic, came into my life like a tornado out of heaven. And I had struggles with being negative, and some of you know my story of Pakistan. They made me dress properly, a suit and a tie, looked like an undertaker. They warned me to be careful of what I said. The bishop was there. I was trying as hard as I could. And the cathedral, the bishop, I was nervous. And as I was speaking, a pigeon flew over, dropped its load on my sleeve in front of the bishop. Typical negative stuff, right? But God was doing a new work in me to make me more optimistic. It was a long road, I'm still on it. And I said, well, just praise the Lord here, folks, that the elephants aren't flying around. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I've ever been the same. I don't know what kind of problems you have. I don't know who's dropping on you, but it's probably not an elephant, it's probably a mouse. And I just wanna close by saying, if God can use a character like me also, a lot of struggle with intellectual doubts. A lot of struggles with God's chosen frozen. Even wanting to punch up Christian leaders, which is really a bad thing to do. Constantly having to repent. Constantly having to go back to the cross. Constantly having to be encouraged by my co-leaders. And I, of course, I stay accountable to them. If God can use such a needy, struggling guy as me. And I've lived for Jesus every single day since my conversion in that Billy Graham meeting. Not in the absence of doubts and struggles. Yes, and sometimes sin. But I've gone back to Jesus as I've been filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. As I realize God actually loves me. I don't understand how he can do that. Because I have trouble loving myself. But hallelujah, it works. And the next time you're discouraged or upset or you're a doubting Thomas or whatever's going on, try to remember, if God can keep this loudmouth, struggling, needy guy from New Jersey going for him every single day, every single day since 16, and start a little mission organization that as of 15 years ago when we stopped counting had given the word of God to one billion people, then he can use you. Don't give up. Don't give up. No matter what, don't give up. Don't give up. God bless you. Let's worship. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.